Thanks, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I, I think foot and ankle chose me, actually. <laughs> I wanted to be a dentist for a long time, and then uh, I, went to the, I went to the other end. But um, thanks for having me on. This is, uh, you know, our days in OR three and four, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever your chosen days are, are always an adventure. And um, as was described, we always try to seek out new opportunities for success. And this has been one of those for me. And I wanted to kind of share that and how uh, my, my uh, experience has been with it, but also other items that have uh, come and gone, as David said, uh, through, through time. And we're starting to see that some things are starting to, to stick, no pun intended. Um, so we have a 32 year old male. Um, so I, what I want to do is kind of highlight a couple things. One is, um, David brought up some opportunities for use in, uh, I would call them critical patients, maybe patients that are, um, smokers, obese, etc. I'm going to kind of put a little trauma spin on it. And then I will put in the kind of everyday utility. And then I want to talk a little bit about some, some pearls with, with rep usage and the reps that are on, like what how can I sell this? How can I make this, you know, uh, sexy again and, and bring back um, this into the OR? Someone that's been using something else for a while. Let's let's talk about a new product. So uh, we'll start, we'll go in that order pretty much. <clears throat> um, so this is uh, a Phoenix dirt bike, a uh, 32 year old male, uh, way on the west side of town where uh, I think Bill Gates just bought like hundred acres or a hundred million acres or something crazy. <laughs> but basically he's, he's riding his dirt bike out there in the middle of nowhere. And, but he has a Harley at home and he, he just got home from his, his uh, motocross uh, activity and decided to go riding his Harley in his uh, cul-de-sac barefoot for whatever reason. And it, it got out from underneath him. So that happened a couple of days ago and he shows up after being seen in urgent care and splinted in the whole nine yards, they deemed it not necessary for him to go to, to a level one trauma center or whatnot, but he, he showed up, he's relatively healthy, young guy. He works at a uh, kind of breaks plus or whatever, and uh, does the standard recreational marijuana, which is gonna show up on every slide nowadays. And uh, no, no obvious fracture blisters or, you know, it was a closed injury and uh, it, was, it was all splinted up, go ahead. So now I'm kind of thinking, you know, what, what do we got going on here? This looks bad. This is not a standard private practice kind of injury. What do we do? So we have a uh, comminuted uh, navicular tarsal dislocation. I mean, there's like 10 ICD, ICD tens in here. So we have a tarsal dislocation. We have a uh, impacted talonavicular joint. We have a stable Liz Frank. We have a calcaneal fracture that you just saw on the CT scan. And uh, we, we need a plan. So this is where kind of the, the rep pops into my head. You're sitting in the room talking to um, Charles or whatever. And you're saying, what, what am I going to need for this case? And my head goes through hardware and then typically extra or other and bone graft is, is at the end of that. Um, not in any way of uh, importance so <clears throat> or priority. So the, the key here is what do we do with a, a dusted navicular? And how can I get this 32-year-old uh, relatively healthy guy back on his motorbike fast and, uh, you know, do that in a steadfast manner? So, um, go ahead. So, the plan basically was fix calc, get that stabilized, uh, then go dorsal medial and approach the TN dislocation and, and, uh, and, and tarsal dislocation and navicular fracture. So, we did it in that order. What we actually had to do was refashion, um, sorry, refashion a, a large portion of his navicular. So the, again, the medial pole was dusted. So that all came out. Then I said, what am I gonna use to pack all these little voids? Um, and how can I get good bony apposition between a femoral head and uh, the, the remaining, aspect, remaining aspect of the, um, uh, navicular and cuneiforms and talus and everything else. So obviously we're talking about stable fixation and this isn't a trauma uh, lecture for, for Midwest or, or PI or whatnot, but um, uh, damage control and, and getting this calc stabilized was our first priority. And then go to the next slide and then stabilizing his TN joint. So 
here's where I utilized uh, putty. So that's been my my priority is or my um, my number one product of the two is is the putty. And I'll, I'll start with the two, and then if I need to, I'll, I'll I'll slap in another two. I would say for most cases, I'm I'm using the the two point five. So and that's there's two different sizes, right? The two point five and the five for for uh, in Phoenix. So for now, <clears throat> so after uh, we got our calc stabilized, then we moved on to our TN joint. At this juncture, we said, you know what, this this tarsal dislocation is not anywhere near just a standard ORAF. We're gonna have to fuse this bad boy because there is nothing left. So it, it kind of sucks, 32 year old with a, a hind foot fusion, but it is what it is. And this can get back him to get him back to working at Brakes Plus and uh, maybe uh, riding a motocross. I gave him six months, but uh, I think he was on the short end of that. Uh, so this was uh, immediately kind of leaving the OR. We felt good about it. We stabilized his navicular. We spackled our uh, nanobone basically on either side of the iliac crest. And uh, we did not tuck it in the calc fracture or anything like that. We were all lateral and uh, we didn't utilize it for the calc fracture, but mainly this, as Dr. Yeager said, this TN joint that has a high propensity to go onto a non-union. How can we save this guy's foot? So next slide, <clears throat> stabilize it with kind of a uh, neutral uh, dorsal uh, locking plate and uh, good bicortical purchase. Um, we did not uh, kind of in order, just is stepwise, I guess you could say. So what we did first was calc, obviously. Then we we uh, uh, built out and refashioned a new navicular is kind of what we did. So after we cut the femoral head on the back table, we spackled both sides of it with our um, nanobone and then fixated it to the lateral portion of the navicular there. You can see that. So rebuilding that navicular and then affixing that to the talus. So that was our RAF uh, midfoot dislocation, uh, navicular fracture, and TN joint all kind of combined. So uh, kind of like you would almost like a Liz Frank fracture dislocation. You go in kind of planning, are we going to fix this or fuse this? How bad are the joints? We get a CT scan and now we're looking at a, a dusted uh, midfoot that we need to fuse. So that was the general concept in terms of consenting and things like that, uh, which are above and beyond the this talk probably but uh what's to note is that his um nc joint was still intact i was trying to save as much as possible and uh that was that was what we could salvage out of the the distal lateral pole of the navicular so what i've found post-operatively i do use incisional vax just as a just putting that out there but what i do find is reduced edema uh compared to other uh, bone graft uh, products that we've used in the past in my OR, reduced drainage, which is super cool. We're not seeing a ton of like um, uh, drainage from these products and uh, the incisions are well healed at this point. He's, I see people back at 10 days and then uh, take off their incisional back, especially for a case like this, and then get him uh, into a cam boot. He was non weight bearing for 10 weeks. I really held him down to the fire and uh, said, hey, man, if you if you want to get on that dirt bike again, you are going to have to like chill out. So <clears throat> after um, about eight weeks, we started physical therapy. We did not utilize a bone stem. And I've found that I've barely had to use bones, have to use bone stems at this point because of what we're using here and talking about today. So that's that's another kind of added little little pearl that we could talk about as a as a rep going into a uh, doctor's office. So next slide. So that was that was uh, we'll call him Charles. He did great. Um, so now we have a 68 year old female left ankle pain, the typical, uh, we don't put it in our charts anymore, but flat feet. She's failed conservative treatment and she's moving on to the surgical conversation and she's exhausted everything in terms of amnio and all the stem cell shots she could purchase uh, that has gone to the wayside. This is a mechanical structural deformity um, I would say her BMI is in the range of 32. She's relatively healthy. She doesn't smoke. It's kind of standard 68 year old Phoenix fit Phoenician, uh, uh, active person that walks the dog and, and wears, uh, wears her hokas every day and, and is trying to maintain a healthy lifestyle, but, uh, she just can't do it anymore. She can't keep up with her friends. Next slide. And she, uh, needs to, to move on to the next, um, to the next option. So you can see here, kind of going from left to right, naturally your eyes go left to right. I, I typically will, if there's a bunion present, my staff will automatically get a 
uh, kind of four foot view standard uh, series included the sesamoid axial. So you can see that those arthritic changes to the first metatarsal sesamoid joint. We would call this like a grade four or so um, met sesamoid joint uh, arthritic changes. And um, that's a whole nother topic. But um, obviously checking our, our radiographic uh, or, or uh, ankle films confirming that our ankle is not in valgus, right? <clears throat> Often we miss that and we don't control it and we um, avoid looking at the ankle from the front, not just the side. So lateral view, you know, this wasn't too impressive uh, radiographically, but clinically it's this, it's, it's what you would imagine. You would see, you can see on the, the AP foot there, her previous navicular fractures or os tibialis externum or whatever, whatever the kids are calling it these days uh, is severely arthritic. And um, so she is in a ton of pain, a lot of, uh, uh, you can see her subfibular impingement on the AP ankle view. And so this is that patient where you're, we're talking about selective arthrodesis versus how bad is the subtalar joint? Are we doing uh, a calc osteotomy versus a, a, a um, Illinois specialty infusion? And uh, that was for you, Dr. Yeager. Thanks, and so, brother. yeah. And so, um, but it, it, in this patient, 68, high BMI, this is a selective arthrodesis or kind of uh, a medial double type approach for me. Next slide. And what, what I've been leaning on recently is really focusing on stabilizing that medial column. And the quickest, easiest, simplest way to do it is a first MTP fusion that stabilizes that FHL and you're able to bring down that, that uh, first MTP well. So after we did our spackle job intraoperative, Lee, uh, this case was about five cc's. We were able to get in a ton. You can see it right there. So she's about um, three, three and a half ish. So, or post op, three and a half months post op here in this image. She's in her um, her ASO, walking in her shoe, getting back to walk in Frankie the the Bichon Freese, and she's super happy. So, um, this is just another utility, another another option for you to utilize it on this, uh, these type of selective arthrodeses, once you've repositioned that calcaneus, you do typically have a large void in your, your uh, sinus tarsi area and uh, posterior subtalar joint. So being able to fill that cavity with a good amount of uh, the, the, the nano bone. And what I like about it is the, the texture, as, as the, um, the Dr. Yeager mentioned, uh, the texture is super, I'll call it fun. It's, it's, it's nice, it's able, you're able to handle it and put it where you want it and it stays there. So that uh, amorphous silica gel, that ASG is uh, very, very nice handling um, uh, capabilities or qual qual qualities. And that's probably my, my number one um, besides it or actually working um, is uh, I guess my number two uh, um, pearl. Next, <clears throat> she's doing great. So uh, another one, so this is, uh, we'll just call her Laura, 57 year old female, painful forefoot and uh but she does have some discomfort underneath the second toe but you know it's mainly this the the big toe so what, what are we doing let's look at some x-rays and uh let's let's see what we can do for this this relatively healthy non-smoker again active hiker loves to hike camelback but she wants to get back to her to her tennis game so next slide so again this is this patient that we often see as dr yeager mentioned the second opinions her bunion was done umpteen years ago, but she didn't follow up after her three month follow up when they said go away. And she uh, ended up just kind of floating off into the sunset. And I'm sure she's she's uh, been on many vacations and walked on many beaches and not have had pain, but she comes into the office with continued second MTP pain. So that's what we see in the office, right? We see those patients that, that come in with, um, with uh, pain underneath the second MTP and some metatarsalgia type pain, but then you take your radiographs and your your eyes get all big and you try to control your control the conversation and uh, just kind of gear them in the right steer them in the right direction. And uh, so we're talking about a first MTP fusion. I don't think most people would attempt a revision 15 year old osteotomy uh, and try to salvage the joint, even though it looks as though there's uh, some. Uh, still some cartilage there. She had a negative grind test, but I, I don't think I could let her off the OR table with an unstable first MTP. So in my hands, this is a no brainer. This is kind of what I was referring to uh, at the beginning of the lecture. You know, this is 
where I would typically use a perfect spackle and, um, and, and dress that first MTP perfectly, fill the voids uh, and, and make it work. So next slide. So first MTP fusion standard screw plate uh, construct. Uh, this is about six, eight weeks out or so. And she's, you know, I'm able to transition patients into a post-op shoe faster uh, than, I, than I have normally. And uh, that's, that's always great. So again, I like the early rehab thing too. My MTP fusions, I, I think it's honestly interesting how we as a profession kind of dance around with our um, weight bearing protocol. You know, everybody is, is just, it's not standard. Um, and so there's multiple studies on MTP fusion, midfoot fusion, et cetera. But I, I, I do move, I move people fast too. I, um, uh, have them weight bearing at 10 days and they're out of a cam walker boot and into a post-op shoe right between four and six. I'm having a hard time, like keeping them down. Um, so it's, it's fun. People are doing great. And, uh, and that's, that's another success story. Next. So LR, this is, this is another one where it's a, it's a standard OR2, 11 AM, you're running through your cases. We have a uh, first TMT pain, uh, very active bunion. And <clears throat> so it's, this isn't just for the, the revision, um, high BMI smokers. It can be utilized in your regular everyday cases too. Next standard, uh, bunion patient. And our sesamoid axial view again shows no significant arthritic changes. So we're we're look, looking to do a, a realignment or a reconstruction of her uh, medial column or spine of the foot. Appropriate hind foot to forefoot relationship. So we're not thinking that we have to do anything else. And um, we're we're moving on to to a first TMT fusion. So next. <clears throat> So I typically utilize a cut guide system that allows me to kind of spin it, if you will. And so what we're able to do here, you can see that sesamoid axial, we're able to realign that sesamoid axial well. This is at about six, eight weeks out or so. And still she, these patients are, I mean, she, she actually came in in a tennis shoe at like three weeks. I said, please, please do me a favor. Please at least get into this post-op shoe or, or, or something. Um, she was doing phenomenal. I don't know whether it was the nano bone or whether it was her just being a crazy athlete, but some, something in the, something had to meet in the middle. So <clears throat> she was able to get realigned. Well, we filled any voids. If there is any plantar gapping or whatever you, you run into, you can always fill those voids with uh, some sticky nano bone and you don't have to worry about it running away from me as Dr. Yeager said. So she, another success story and she uh, is doing well next. So how I would kind of spin this as I, um, kind of go into to a doctor's office that's, you know, that they are a, a heavy right medical user, you know, that they are a um, uh, autograph user or whatever the case may be. This, this stuff works. It's, it's proven. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. And this is another opportunity for, uh, as Dr. Yeager was describing, kind of a high risk patient where you can spackle it on to these metallic implants. This is a custom TTC fusion that we did yesterday. And so he's, he's not fully healed yet, but almost. And so, um, uh, but we, we know that that HA is more natural. Who, who, who you can't argue against more natural. And uh, the, the handling char characteristics are, are awesome. So uh, those are two things that you need to show your, uh, if you are a rep on this call uh, or distributor or whatnot, <clears throat> you need to uh, bring it into the office, squeeze it in their hand, allow them, put, tell them to put a glove on first so it feels more like you are in the OR and, um, or bring some gloves from the OR so they can feel what it would be, you know, what it would be like in the OR. And, um, and you know, you typically don't need uh, autograph with this, as he, as he said, or was stated. And I did mix a little, a little BMA here just to make myself feel better, but I do pull BMA on most cases. I'm, I, I hate to admit it, but, um, again, all natural and you can stuff it into little crevices and please try it out. Cause I think the, the handling characteristics are above and beyond. So some cool cases. And I hope you, you don't just focus on the the obvious kind of non-unions and stuff, those are, those are great cases, but um, please, please think about your, your obvious cases too. Uh, we want to keep those MTP fusion uh, non-union rates down 
And uh, as we are trying to mo mobilize and move these people faster, I think it is an easy way to uh, continue that success story. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, any questions?